So my name is Albert Kausch. I'm the professor for this class. Um, brief background, I did my bachelor's in uh, biological sciences from the State University of New York, master's and PhD from Iowa State in molecular biology, postdoc at Rockefeller University, and um, I didn't make the first transgenic plant. I think I made the fifth one though. And after that, I worked in industry for a number of years for Pfizer in a collaboration with DeKalb Genetics, where we did make the first genetically modified corn plant in the world. And now um, pretty much all corn in the US is genetically modified, which I think brings uh, a nice perspective to this course in general. But before we get to that, uh, I thought what we would do in the first part of tonight is give you a perspective on the course in general. What we expect to see during uh, the semester and what we will cover. In the second part of tonight, I will go over the course description, requirements, uh, what will be required of you, um, and sort of set the stage for uh, the rest of the semester. We will have back-to-back -back lectures followed by uh, usually an eight-minute break. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, business for the second part of tonight. So actually, this course, I think, should be an eye-opening experience to all of us in terms of what's happening now in the various different fields of biotechnology and give us some insight into what will likely happen into the future. What is happening now is striking enough. Certainly, if you put on your futuristic binoculars and look forward from where we are now, uh, you can have some very interesting perspectives. So tonight, in the first part, I'll give you an introduction to the course as an overview. Biotechnology is sometimes understood as a panacea that will fix a lot of different problems in the life sciences, the environment, energy, and so on. Or it's viewed as Pandora's box. Once we start opening these tools, many of them have dual use. Think of bioweapons as the other side of synthetic biology. I sometimes ask uh, the question, starting this class, what do you think the most significant human accomplishments are of the last 100 years? You can come up with your own list if you want. Um, when I ask this, though, in Jay Leno style on the street, what do you think about this kind of question? Oftentimes, landing on the moon falls high on that list. Neil Armstrong just passed away about a few weeks ago. And you can remember that when you look at the next full moon. He was the first human to set foot on the moon. So landing on the moon, no doubt, was a great accomplishment. Some people say nuclear power. And certainly it has its dual use problems. Antibiotics, probably this room wouldn't even be half full without them. Imagine a world without antibiotics. Scratch your finger and die of an infection. The internet. Sometimes I wish we could undo that one. Redo. <laughs> the Haber-Borsch reaction. Mm. You say, what is that? It changed agriculture. It changed our environment. But we'll get more into that later. So landing on the moon was great. Getting there, certainly without computers, was quite an achievement. But you know what? Ultimately, none of you will go there. And by any estimations, the moon's a rock. Let's consider what the most significant human accomplishments ever were in history. If that was the last hundred years, how have we done so far? Fire? Fire was a good day. Wasn't covered by CNN. But um, let's face it, that changed the course of humanity. Language. Also, pretty good idea, I think. The wheel, not all societies had them, and they did reasonably well without it. And you can read about 
the influence of those technologies in Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Why did some societies succeed and other ones fail? But agriculture, agriculture, that was good. That happened nearly simultaneously around the world about 10,000 years ago in different parts of the world. And it had a profound influence on humanity, moving it from a hunting-gathering society into civilization. Writing did not happen until agriculture. All other Neolithic developments of civilization, government, land, property law, all of that happened because of and after agriculture. So writing would not have occurred without the advent of agriculture. On this list, I would include DNA technologies. While this course is primarily focusing on biotechnology, the major focus of that will be about DNA-based technologies. So in future generations, probably when they look back at us, they will think, those were the ones that discovered how to use DNA. Right now, we're in a crisis. I probably don't need to tell you that. In fact, um, we are in not one crisis, but many. We're in an environmental crisis by any measure. Extinctions rate Extinction rates now parallel that of the dinosaur era. Toxicities are building up. Resources are diminishing. Climate change. Global foreign policy. Wars, energy. Diminishing fossil fuel reserves. Diminishing world food reserves. Water availability and arable land is diminishing, putting crisis on human health. Underlying all of this is an expanding population. We're still growing exponentially. So the faster the population grows, the more demands are put onto resources and massive consequences to the environment. A friend of mine, an algologist, a phycologist, one who studies algae, said that the biggest struggle to humans going forward will be whether or not we toxify ourselves out of existence. But we are certainly in exponential growth phase. There are now 7 billion people on the planet. There will be 10 billion people by maybe 2050. Who will feed those people? Where will we get the land to feed those people? Can agriculture at that point be sustainable? Energy resources? 90% of that increase will occur in developing countries. Most of that in cities. Right now, 1.2 billion people live on less than a dollar a day. Half of the world's population lives on rice. Half of those live on less than a cup of rice a day. As developing countries go from vegetarian to meat-eating countries, that will put more severe demands on those resources. 40,000 people a day starve to death. Over a million suffer from vitamin A deficiencies, particularly in developing countries. Who will feed these people? the technologies of the Northern Hemisphere, or will they develop the technologies on their own? The United States is 350 million people or so, but uses about 26% of the world's resources. By any math, the world cannot afford two United States. The man who has bread has many problems. The man who has no bread has one. But you may ask then, how many people can we possibly put here? What is the carrying capacity of the globe? Before we run out of space, 
before we toxify the environment? When do we reach the top of the exponential curve? The economist would say that as resources become limiting, humans will innovate their way out of that. As oil diminishes, we will invent a new energy resource. This has been tried and true in the past, as other resources have been diminished. The economist then would argue that there is no upper limit to carrying capacity. Hmm, I'm a biologist. We'll get more to that later. But the biologist would say that if I put one bacteria into a petri dish with a growth media sufficient to sustain it, it divides to two, to four, to eight, and so on, until you hit exponential growth. Eventually, food resources diminish, and death equates life, and that curve plateaus, toxicities build up, and it crashes to zero. We are ultimately in a finite space. What is the carrying capacity of the globe? If you do that experiment, you put a bacteria into a tube, and it does divide like this, in one hour, it will fill that tube. Back that off at 100% in 60 minutes. If you diminish that by one minute, 59 minutes, you are only 50% full. 58 minutes, you're 25% full. 57 minutes, you're only 12.5%. 57 minutes, you're only 6.25%. With 3%, you still have five minutes left to go. You're only 3% full. You're looking around and saying, we got plenty of food, we got plenty of resources, no problem. Two minutes go by and things start getting crowded. And you say, Jack, we got to figure a way out of this. How about you invent a new test tube? And by a minute left, things are getting pretty severe. Where are we on the human growth curve? Donald Kennedy was the uh, former editor of the journal Science in uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Science is the premier scientific journal in the world, peer-reviewed science. And he, this quote is interesting, that he says that a solution to a sustainable source of energy may be the most significant challenge to the future of human survival, recognizing the fact that uh, there's only so much oil on this finite resource oil being our primary uh, source of energy right now. So if you're the optimistic economist, what role will innovation play to get us out of these crises? Underlying this, I think we can make a position in this class. What role will biotechnologies and the life sciences play as it impinges on all of those crises? And maybe all of those crises come down to really one, the population issue. When we consider biotechnology in general, I don't know if you talk about this with your peers or how you ended up in this class in the first place, but biotechnology is by nearly any perspective controversial. If you think about all of the different topics that we will cover in this class, every single one of them has a controversial edge to it. And the more we go down the road in advancement in biotechnologies, the further we get from a public perspective and appreciation of it. So that major decisions that are now being made about policies that govern whether or not we use stem cell research to go ahead or not depend on public education. And right now I think that there is a wide disparity in the knowledge of the general public about biotechnology in general and what we're capable of doing with it. And that gap is growing wider all the time. Recently, I was asking somebody, um, also in a Jay Leno style interview you know, in a grocery store, what do you think of GMOs? That'd be genetically modified organisms. And they said, I don't know, but I'm against them. Wow. Um, you know, and you say, well, what are they? Well, I don't know, but I'm against them. Um, so I think a lot of policies now about the science that we're capable of doing are largely being made out of default. And call me biased in my opinion, but I don't think there's a more socially relevant course that you could be involved with now. 
Actually, I think that a working knowledge of DNA and genetics uh, is as fundamental to a basic education as an understanding of the solar system. We teach the solar system and the planets around the sun, I think, grade three or four. But how many people can actually tell you how you go from DNA out to an organism that's capable of discussing it, let alone cloning it? This is a brief history of um, modern biotechnology. Actually, humans have been using biotechnology for 10,000 years or longer. Uh, biotechnology refers to taking something from life and using it for human purpose. So certainly the, the use of domesticated crops and animals fits into that definition. But really in this class, as I said, we're going to be discussing largely DNA-based biotechnologies, which would begin with the elucidation of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953. Knowing the structure of DNA really changed our perspective on life itself, let alone what we can now do uh, with, with that knowledge. So here's a brief list, and you can notice some things on there. 1984, the first genetically modified plants. Um, Dolly, the first cloned sheep, 1997. Uh, accelerating up to knowing all of the genes in a human in 2001. Every single base pair letter was decoded. So now we know the genetic code for humans. But now also we know the genetic code of mice, rats, rice, and lots of other organisms. Giving rise to actually, in 2010, the first synthetic cell. So the future of biotechnology from where we are now seems nearly science fiction. But look at how rapidly things happen. Who could have predicted a decade ago that you'd be carrying 18 gigs in your pocket? And what influence will this have during your lifetime? So in the first section of this class, I propose that we cover the mechanisms of life. How do we go from DNA out to life? I will position this in the central question of what is life. In the second part, we will look at the applications of biotechnology in their various different fields. This is not an eye exam, but a poster that we presented recently uh, at some international meetings on the development of this as an online course. And it shows the basic um, different parts of the course itself, showing that in the first part here, and you, I think this is available online so you could actually read this stuff. But uh, in this part here, we will cover what is life. Uh, and involved in that, the different techniques involved with biotechnology. How is DNA sequenced? How is DNA cloned, etc. In the second part, the different aspects of biotechnology. And I'll show you some of these in just a minute. And interspersed in here are the ethics. Should we? What happens if we? What happens when we? So in the first part, we need to understand the mechanics of DNA. Uh, sounds rather dry, but actually the question, what is life? What is life? Probably you all assume that this is an easy question. I ask this of PhD candidates, uh, and lots of other smart people have considered it in the past. Erwin Schrodinger, the physicist who discovered the particle wave duality of light, in the 1940s published a series of essays under this title, What is Life? Can you describe it? Really? Give it a shot. Uh, probably. Most naive definitions of life will be defied by its exceptions. As soon as you say you think you know what life is, biological life will surprise you. But they do have some commonalities. So what is life? I think we need to consider that as its basis, at the basis of understanding then how we work with life. 
which is really what I would rather call this course. Issues in biotechnology sounds rather negative. Issues? Um, I didn't come up with that title, but um, I would rather suggest maybe uh, the way we work with life might be more appropriate. But if you're going to ask what is life, then um, what is death? That has been a question that has plagued people for hundreds of thousands of years. Hey, Jack was here a minute ago and now he's gone. All his stuff is here, but he's not here somehow. Where did he go? What was it that left Jack? All his biochemistry is still there. His bones are still here. But what happened? What was the thing that left? What is the stuff that keeps him here? And then this idea about life on other planets. Well, now we're on Mars, several billion dollars later, and that's a great achievement too. And we're there to look for water, basically, and a few carbon molecules, you know. Um, is water required for life? I think we should consider this. Is there water everywhere in the universe? How rare is that? Why do we think that water should be required for life? Is carbon required for life? You know, there's only one periodic table in the whole universe, and that's the one that we have. Some of the elements that are on our periodic table didn't exist here before humans made them, but they exist someplace. So there's not another periodic table, you know. This is only predicted by physics. So you're stuck with the periodic table. So when stuck with the periodic table, what must you have? What are the requirements for life itself? You can't think of a chemistry based on lead, for example. I don't care if you're Isaac Asimov. That's not going to happen. You can't combine enough with lead to make the multiplicity of chemicals that you need to support life, period. You might think of other chemistries, silicon, maybe. So biologically, we need to, we need to get our handle on this. What is life? How does it work? How does it happen? How did it happen here? What's the possibility that it happened someplace else? If it happened someplace else, would it look like this? How do we understand life here from its mechanisms? We need to do this. I want you to walk out of this class with a different perspective on everything living. And then, once you know that, put that into some sort of philosophical perspective. How could you not? Understanding life? Life is more than a day at the beach, for example. Um, you could say, what is life? Life is precious. Life is short. People come up with all kinds of answers. But I will guarantee you that once you have a perspective on biological life, it will change the way you look at things. What are we doing here, for example? Who are you? Are you merely an expression of your genes? Is there free will? What is consciousness? Is it just a biological construct? Billiard balls set in motion eons ago after the Big Bang, and now here you find yourself in this class? Is there intrinsic meaning to anything? Or is it merely all biological? The existentialist writers said there is no meaning. Later on, writers like Milan Kundara would say the only meaning in anything is the meaning you bring to it. A biologist sees function, that there is no purpose. And yet other people might say the only purpose in anything is the purpose you bring to it. What is life? Obviously, it's complex. This is a book uh, authored by Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan. Lynn Margulis uh, just passed away two years ago. She was a professor at um, UMass Amherst and came up with an extraordinary idea about how uh, complex cells evolved from simpler cells. And when she thought about this, basically, um, <laughs> People laughed. It seemed uh, pretty far out. Um, this was before the advent of electron microscopy and certainly uh, molecular biology, which then went on to show that 
her ideas uh, gained significant support to the point where people pretty much think that that's the way it happened. She married Carl Sagan, who you may have heard of, and they had a son, Dorian Sagan, who co-authored this book, What is Life? And she has some extraordinary uh, perspectives on uh, this question of what is life. And so if you're interested in uh, her answer to this question, you might seek that out. But how does life work should give us a perspective then on all of this that I have just mentioned. There is this book by um, Malin Hoagland, illustrated by Bert Dodson, on the way life works. I've used some of their illustrations throughout this course. First of all, in the next lecture, we will uh, look at uh, how life builds from the very basics. We have to put this all in perspective. And this should be a general audience course. I don't care really if you're a business major, an art major, or a biology major. This course is not meant to weed people out that will go into the biological sciences. I rather care that you understand what's going on uh, in the world today related to uh, these sciences. So we'll start actually with atoms. And I know you've had this before. But we have to put this into a new perspective. This issue of Time Magazine in 2003 celebrated uh, the 50th anniversary of Watson and Crick discovering the structure of DNA, depicting Adam and Eve on the cover surrounded by the double helix. This is the first paragraph of the famous paper that was published in April 25th, 1953 issue of Nature uh, by Watson and Crick. And I'll point out more about this particular paper in the third lecture, but I'll draw your attention right now to the first paragraph. We, is to, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, that's DNA. This structure has novel features, which are of considerable biological interest. If that's not an understatement of the century, of considerable biological interest, eh? So, um, yes. And we will remember this famous cartoon because it now has become an icon really for science itself and many other uh, things in, in the world. When reporters asked Francis Crick what they had discovered, what was the significance of the double helix in 1953, his answer was, the secret of life. Oh, really? Well, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize for uh, his contribution in that 1962. So um, what did he mean that they had discovered the secret of life? Well, aside from understanding that the structure of DNA depicts that there must be an informational code depicted within this structure, they also showed that when DNA replicates, as it does every time one of your cells divides, it must copy itself. You are three billion letters that compose your DNA. While I've been having this discussion, you've copied that DNA several times without barely a thought, and hopefully with very few mistakes. But the structure of DNA depicts also that it is capable of replicating. There's something about life here, an informational code that's capable of replication with variation. So the information in DNA we will see is processed into an intermediate molecule called RNA and then into the language of proteins. Proteins do all the work in cells. Genes code for proteins, so by controlling the information that codes for proteins, we control all the other characteristics. Your eye color, your behavior, all of the rest are biological constructs controlled by proteins. Structural proteins like hair, muscle, tendons. Metabolic proteins that digest what you ate for lunch. 
transporters that move things throughout your body, hemoglobin, for example. Regulators that turn gene sequences on and off, as well as regulating metabolism. Defenders like antibodies that tell the difference between you and some other organism. And communicators like hormones. All are proteins coded for by your genes, which collectively make you. Each one of you is unique. Yes, I took a PhD in biology to make that observation. Quite clever, aren't I? But this flow of information, actually, I would say a flow of information generally, is one of the characteristics of life. All life on this planet uses the same genetic code. It uses the same 20 amino acids. This has interesting implications for how we use this information in biotechnology. What is a cell? A cell was actually discovered several hundred years ago now as a basic unit of life. But what is it but a construct of proteins and their activity? Taken all together as a conglomerate, they make a human being in one case of its depiction. You know, there are about three trillion cells in a human, and there are about 10 times as many microorganisms in you. So an alien might look at you and say, what an interesting vessel for microorganisms. In other words, there's 10 times as much bacteria in you as there are you in you. And we can look at the microbiome, too, and understand it. So what is life? It seems as though it is a collection of different things, a collection of different cells, a collection of different pieces of information. Why sex? That's weird. Why two? Why not eight or nine? Wouldn't that make things more interesting? Why is there a predominance of bilateral symmetry? There are some round things. You know, uh, sea urchins and starfish and stuff have radial, radial symmetry. But by and large, there is a predominance in this planet of bilateral symmetry. Why is that? Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils. Why is there polarity? There's an up and a down to pretty much everything. A head and a foot, a root and a shoot. Hmm. And then I mentioned this aspect of philosophy when you look at biology. Don't you think that it's a little bit odd that given all of this duality, we come up with concepts like right and wrong? Hmm. Do, that, do you think that's just a coincidence? Good, bad, left, right. Hmm. So we could consider in our definition of life, not just a strict definition only, but what are the, some of the commonalities? What are some of the trends that predominate life on this planet? I've mentioned some of them already. There are 16 things that I've made, collected from some other people, that uh, have some common features, that we should say, about life on this planet that you may find interesting. One of these would be evolution, in itself a controversial topic. But evolution is a pattern in biology that's consistent amongst pretty much everything living. If you say just a theory, I would question your definition of just, and then I would question your definition of theory. Maybe we should change this to, given biology, there will be change. Change is consistent in biological life no matter where you look. Over 99% of the species that have ever existed in the history of this planet are now extinct. What happened to them? How did we get here? What happens going forward? How does change occur biologically? 
What is evolution at the molecular level? How does that transmit to the individual? Well, actually, from the molecule to the cell to the individual to the population. How does evolution work? I really want you to understand this. I really want you to understand from the DNA level out how evolution happens. I don't think believing in evolution is no longer on the menu. It's a matter of whether you understand it or not. How does evolution happen? Why then is it controversial? Why is it that a wildebeest might be attracted to a female wildebeest and vice versa? In amongst those questions and those definitions of life, we have to look at now, how do we work with this information in the context of science? Uh, in the techniques, I will smatter these throughout the first third of the course because uh, once you understand how DNA replicates, we can look at those using that same technique that cells use to copy DNA, we can look at how humans have exploited that same technology to our own benefit. In other words, the way DNA replicates is the way that we copy genes. So how are reactions like the polymerase chain reaction used in forensics to identify people? What is the polymerase chain reaction? How do we use these technologies to copy and sequence DNA? How is a gene cloned? I could take a DNA sample from you and isolate the gene for your hemoglobin. That might take me a couple of days. I could clone it and have a vat of it by the end of the week. I have too much to do, don't worry. And I don't know why I would want to do that anyway. I could simply go to the database and synthesize it because now we know all the genes in humans. It's available on the database. Genomes. The first genome that was sequenced actually manually was a bacteria, Haemophilus influenza 1995. Has roughly over 961 genes. The roundworm C. elegans was sequenced in 1999, about 19,900 genes or so. Genes code for proteins, they're only a subset of the DNA. The fruit fly was sequenced in year 2000, came in under 19,000 genes, even though it has significantly more sophisticated behavior than a roundworm. So since the human genome published in year 2001, we now understand has about 24,567 genes or so. Slightly more than a roundworm and about the same as a sponge. Biology now has moved out of a simply descriptive science and into a quantitative era of information. We now know the genomes of a couple hundred different organisms. So with the first draft of the human genome shown here on the cover of Nature, the same journal that Watson and Crick first published in, we see the double helix. I don't know if you can make it out there, but it is made of a composite of human faces. Very cool. And I would say that the accomplishment of landing on the moon pales in significance to understanding the human genome. Why? First of all, none of you are going to the moon. Second of all, the moon's a rock. But knowing all the genes in humans will have a direct impact on your life. It already has. And it will continue to accelerate. The mouse genome was subsequently published in year 2002. So knowing all the genes in mice, also a significant breakthrough. Notice that in this mosaic, it's also comprised of human faces because there is significant overlap. 
the mouse genome is 88% the same as a human genome. Hmm. And many, most of the genetic diseases that humans get have a mouse model. Therefore, if we can study intractable genetic diseases in mice, we will have a basis for applying that knowledge to human pharmacy and medical applications. The rice genome was published in the same year. You might say, big deal, huh? It's just a plant. Hmm. Well, it actually feeds half the world or so. And for your 24,567 genes, none of you seem to photosynthesize so well. The rice genome has about 44,000 genes or so, are roughly nearly twice as many as you do. Just to put it into perspective, from a genetic IQ, you're not doing so well. I would also suggest that there's a significant anthropocentric bias that humans have. We're so great. Really? Hmm. Like I said, you don't photosynthesize so well. But what is a genome? I've used that word already a couple of times. A genome is all the DNA in an organism. Your DNA is only 4% genes. We should ask, what's the rest of it doing? But all the, the genome includes its genes. Genes carry the information for proteins. The rest of that DNA, some of it is regulating when those genes are turned on and off. You have eye-specific genes, you have liver-specific genes. How do we control those? Some of the genes that were on in you during development are off now. Some will be on later, perhaps involved in diseases like cancer. What if you could know your genetic code? Would you want to? The first human genome took over a billion dollars. You can buy yours now for about 3,000. Very interesting. And what would that do for you? That would help you to understand perhaps your disease predispositions. It might help you understand your genealogy. Okay, after we've gotten through this part of what is life and what are some of its tools, how will we examine in this class how these tools are put to use? First, we have to recognize that all of, knowing all of the genes, knowing all of this information, has had a huge impact on humans already. What will knowing all of the genes in humans do? Well, it certainly will influence the way we do medicine. It already has. It'll influence the way we do pharmacy, making new drugs out of synthetic molecules designed to fit their receptors, based on knowledge, not just spray and pray. Anthropology used to be a science of arrowheads and shards of clay. Two weeks ago, they synthesized all of the DNA from the little finger of a girl they found in a cave that was 18,000 years old in Siberia and recognize the relationship between that human being, Neanderthals, and modern humans. This is incredible. We now know all the DNA in Neanderthals. And they did mate with modern humans. Roughly about 4 to 7 percent of the DNA in Northern Europeans is directly descendant from Neanderthals. Who are we? Where did we come from? It'll also influence what we understand about psychology. Friends of mine and other universities suggest that all psychology departments should be moved under the heading of biology since all, bi all psychology is in fact behavior and all behavior is modified by neuroreceptors and neurobiology, and hence all psychology is then biology. I'm sure most psychologists wouldn't agree with that. It'll affect psychiatry. The way we 
design molecules to influence neuroreceptors and neurotransmitters like SSRIs, affecting how we treat depression and other disorders like this. It has rocked the way we do forensics. All of you will leave a piece of you behind here today. If I really needed to, I could prove that you were here. Will it affect the way we do insurance? If you have your genome sequenced for $3,000 and I'm an insurance company and see that you have a predisposition uh, for this or that disease, could I change the policy accordingly? Biotechnology now permeates the life sciences. So I don't care in this class whether or not you are a life science major because it will influence your life irrespective of that. And this has influenced its applications in the pharmaceutical and health industries, creating career opportunities that did not exist before. Take notice of this. In this economy, biotechnology is a growth sector, and it will continue to be. It's extended through all of the life sciences industries because Pure science and biotechnology is nearly immediately applied. This year, nearly all commercial corn, soybean, canola, and cotton are genetically modified. Corn, I'm not talking, when I talk about corn generally in agriculture, you're, you're familiar with it mainly from sweet corn. That's about 0.4% of the U.S. corn crop. Corn, grain corn that makes corn syrup, feed corn, so on. That's a $53 billion industry in the U.S. So agricultural biotechnology has huge implications. To put that in perspective, you know, Lipitor, a blockbuster drug, Viagra, blockbuster drug, 1.5 billion. Hmm, that's only about one quarter of the lettuce industry. So in agricultural biotechnology, first we'll look at where our food comes from. You might say the grocery store. There's not one thing in your grocery store that existed before human intervention. All of your fruits and vegetables do not grow in the wild and would not exist without humans. From there, we'll look at genetic modification. How now can we use genes to influence agriculture? And then what issues and controversies does that bring up? What are the ethics? And how might that play on renewable energy resources? I've already said it was a crucial event. Where do these plants come from? It's now possible to clone any gene from any organism and move that into plants. I mentioned the gene from you for your hemoglobin. Let's go on with that. I could take that gene after a week, put it behind the appropriate expression cassettes, move it into a plant, and express the gene for his hemoglobin in a corn plant, and that might take me about nine months. Again, I have better things to do. But nonetheless, that is where we are. Any gene you want from any organism in a plant for whatever characteristic you would want to convey. This is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. Are genetically modified plants safe? I hope so. You've been eating them for a long time now. Actually, pretty much your whole life. But not only is that true for plants, that same technology applies to how we make drugs, how we can genetically engineer animals, and basically how we will genetically engineer humans. In pharmaceuticals, we can say that DNA-based bi biotechnology has affected the way that we make drugs. It'll affect the way that we use drugs and tailor drugs specifically to certain individuals. A drug that might be good for you could kill her. That'd be good to know ahead of time. Or a drug that might be good for you might not do anything for her. And that'd be good to know too, based on DNA. We can clone genes and make new drugs. The drug Enbrel, made down the road from here by Amgen, that entire plant, that you see off at of 95, I guess it's about exit eight or so, uh, makes one drug, 
Enbrel to treat rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. Those are both autoimmune diseases. Those are made, those drugs are proteins that are made by genetic modification. So knowing all your genes for $3,000 will allow personalized medicine. Knowing a drug that might be good for you could kill you, that's good to know. But also, what disease predispositions do you have? Some of those you won't be able to do anything about. That could be a real bummer to find out that you have a, a disease that you will get based on your genetics that has no cure. How would that affect your life? On the other hand, there could be disease predispositions that you could have that would affect your lifestyle. That might have a big influence on the way you lead your life. So uh, the study of pharmacogenomics, genetics and public health. There are diseases that are rampant in our society now. Diabetes, heart disease, obesity. Knowing genomics will under help us understand anthropology. As I said, who are we? Where did we come from? We now know, based on genomics, the out of Africa hypothesis, so-called, is no longer up for question. All humans originated in Africa. We're all African Americans. The New World was populated about 12 or 14,000 years ago or so, down to Tierra del Fuego by 10,000 years. How are we related? Where did we come from? Medical biotechnology, I'll cover some historical highlights and then get into the basics of how DNA affects medical biotechnology, including cell, stem cell research, personalized stem cells, and how that relates to the development of the potential for human cloning. But what is it that divides our thinking about stem cells? Should we do this? Should we not do this? If we don't, somebody will. What's involved? Who should decide? In August 2001, George W. Bush outlawed federal funding for stem cell research. The UK put the pedal to the metal and made over about 6,000 patents on, on stem cell research in the time that we were sitting on our thumbs. So who decides? The public? Not if they're not informed. We can now genetically engineer plants. You're eating them in the grocery store all the time. You had some for lunch, I bet. We can genetically engineer animals. We know all the genes in many of them. We can clone animals, too. So we can genetically engineer them and clone them. I'll show you how to clone an animal. This has been done for lots of different mammals now, including even primates. Realize then that it's only a matter of time. How would you like your clone steak? How do you feel about that? All of us know someone who have been touched by cancer, probably a relative. What's the biology of it? What is cancer? How does it happen? How do you prevent it? Can you? How do you treat it? Why don't we know these things? What are the most promising emerging treatments? I also will take some time in this class to discuss the coming pandemic. This is not a matter of if. This is really a matter of when. Historically, there have been pandemic outbreaks of influenza A that have had devastating effects globally. Again, this is not a matter of if. I will show the movie Contagion, um, whether in class or not, probably not, but whenever we can put that in, we'll try to fit this in. Because actually, I don't know if you've seen it, but this is um, not science fiction. 
I think it's a, a, it's a fairly accurate depiction of how a pandemic outbreak would play out in the United States and globally. Right down to the pipetters in the science, they used a virologist on the screenplay to make sure that all of this was factual. And I'm pretty persnickety about this when I review Hollywood myself. So yes, it's only a matter of time. Recently, researchers in the Netherlands uncovered mutations in the now circulating H1N1 virus in avians that may result in the next pandemic. And they looked at the five mutations that would cause it to become transmissible from human to human, causing quite a controversy. Because right now, it's only in birds. However, there's only 18 genes. And those are sequenced very quickly. Couldn't someone with the wrong attitude make those mutations? There again, we have this dual use problem. What is now an avian flu tomorrow could be a bioweapon. And that leads us to bioweapons. And I will cover bioweapons in this class, uh, what they are, historically how they've been developed, and what will probably be in store for the future. It's a lot cheaper to make a bioweapon than it is to make a nuclear bomb. You can see people making a nuclear bomb from the air. And actually, making a nuclear bomb is not technically that hard. Um, you can look it up on the web. Making, making a nuclear bomb, the actual how to do it part, isn't the hard part. It's getting the stuff to do it. And actually, making a bioweapon isn't that hard either. And um, any well-trained master's or PhD student could, could do this in a very small space. So if bioterrorism is a threat, what are the counter defenses that we might have? I will lead then into forensics. How is DNA evidence used to implicate people in crimes? DNA, other than sexual offenses, does not prove whether a person did a crime. It's circumstantial evidence, albeit strong, about crime scenes. Was a person there? So DNA identification, how is it done? It's nothing like CSI. Don't get too excited. But how is DNA used to identify people? We will go over several um, case studies. Lastly, if there's time, I think we should consider marine biotechnology. Fisher one of the only wild resources that humans still harvest. Shame. We will take them all until they're all gone. There used to be a lot of cod, you know, off the coast here. They've been made into fish sticks. Um, whales. Diminishing resources globally, environmental impacts. So what do we do about that? Well. We will continue to eat fish. So we better learn how to grow it, right? Or manage it better. So uh, how will DNA technologies impinge upon marine resources? We can now genetically engineer fish like these salmon that could grow in aquaculture faster on lower resources. But these have been prohibited by the FDA from entering the market largely due to public perception issues. How do you like your genetically engineered salmon? There's a certain yuck factor people have. They want their wild salmon. I would also like to consider that all of these technologies are patented, and the role that industry plays in biotechnology and in careers. Whether you're in life sciences or not, there is a growing sector which you should be aware of about biotechnology. Whether that is that you're in a business sector, financially, or whether you're in a, a, a legal sector, 
whether that's patent law or other litigations, whether you're in supply chain management, advertising, all kinds of different careers have opened up around uh, the, the growth of these fields. I used to put ethical issues in the last part. I now will include them throughout this class so that ethical issues we should consider as we move forward. I don't like to take them all at once though because I think we all ought to be on some even ground before we ask these questions, don't you? Otherwise we could spend a lot of time arguing about things we don't fully all understand yet. But why is it controversial? Should we form a DNA database of all humans? What about privacy rights? I'm with you. How do you feel about genetically engineered foods? What about stem cell research versus abortion rights? Should we be conducting human genetic research? What about cloning humans? Will we? What about when we? The world does not share your ethics. If there's a good reason to, somebody will. What about genetic engineering humans? Same thing. If there's a good reason to, somebody will. Right now, people are concerned whether Lance Armstrong used doping to win the Tour de France. Can you think of ways that you could genetically modify someone transiently to do the same effect that, that wouldn't be detectable? Hmm. Has this been done? Hmm. What about human integrity? Some people have suggested, including myself, that we are the last of the genetically wild humans. How will future societies look back at us as the ones that developed DNA technologies? Are we playing God? Who should decide? When should we intervene? How should we intervene? How will bi biotechnology affect the fate of future societies? How will society affect the fate of biotechnology? To clone or not to clone? That's not the question. It's more like, what will you think when we? How would we intervene? Larry Summers was the former president of Harvard and in his farewell address said, I believe that when the history of this period is written 250 years from now, what happens in the life sciences and biotechnology during the next quarter century is likely to be a large part of it. It's time to respond to the crises that I mentioned with every tool in the box. Just as the winged energies of delight carried you over many chasms early on, now raise the daringly imagined arches holding up astounding bridges. Miracle does not lie only in the amazing living through and defeat of danger. Miracles become miracles in the clear achievement that is earned. To work with things is not hubris. When building an association beyond words, denser and denser the pattern becomes. Being carried along is not enough. So take your well-disciplined strength and stretch it between two opposing poles because it's inside human beings where God learns. That's Rainia Maria Rilke. I think a good way to start the class. Let's take a short break. <laughs>